So it gives me great pleasure today to welcome Professor Anita Hardin and Dr. Angeliki Palianas, two thinkers whose work I found very rewarding personally, to the Welcome Center for Cultures, Environments and Health today to speak under the title Toxicity Across Scales, Transdisciplinary Engagements with Pollution and Exposure. My name is Arthur Rose and I'll be chairing the session today, which aims to explore the multifaceted issues of pollution, toxicity and exposure from the individual level to the global scale, while delving into the interconnections between different scales of pollution and their cumulative effects. Our, our talk today will be captioned by Maria O'Brien. First, I'll call on Professor Harden to, give, uh, to speak for 20 to 30 minutes. Then we'll take a five minute break to give Maria and anyone reading the captions the chance to have a break. Um, then Dr. Balianis will talk for 20 to 30 minutes, and then we'll have some minutes for questions before ending at 4.30. Um, but first, I'd like to invite Professor Harden, uh, Professor and Chair of the Knowledge, Technology and Innovation Group at Wageningen uh, University to present her talk, which is titled Navigating Cumulative Toxicities in Everyday Life Insights from multimodal fieldwork in Amsterdam, Baguio, and Marikina. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. When I found your center online, I thought, oh, wow, that, that's where I would like to be working, an interdisciplinary center, working on, a, on an issue that I, uh, yeah, I've started working on now. So the, the past project I did was on the chemical lives of young people. And now I speak to the computer for the online people. So now I've moved to the new topic, which actually emerged from my past work on chemical use, which is to do with the kind of cumulative exposures to chemicals in everyday life. So the chemical use project was still about, mainly about kind of acts of taking chemicals for all kinds of things, for caffeine to be awake or to sleep or to feel good or to be beautiful or to, play around with your gender. Um, and we realized at the end of that project that we had left out or not paid enough attention to all the other chemicals that we're entangled with in our everyday lives. And together with two of the um, PhD students from that project, we started reading and thinking and developed this new project, which was awarded a ERC advanced grant, which is great because it gives us five years to keep on working on the issues but we've only been doing it for four months. So this is very preliminary. The paint is very, very wet. And uh, we, we decided to focus in this um, talk on an issue that emerged as really important in the past project, which is harm reduction. Uh, we developed the ideas for the talk collaboratively. So I should thank my, my team. There is uh, uh, four postdocs involved right now and 30 young researchers in, France, the Netherlands and the Philippines, they've all just started doing field work. So I'm presenting some preliminary ideas on, on harm reduction. I'll first give a little background on the aims of the new project, and then we'll go into some of the observations we have and the point for discussion. So this project is about how we collectively sense, know and act to reduce chemical exposures in everyday life. And inspired by our past project, we, we emphasize really that acting. So we don't want to study damage, as in all of us are affected by pollution, but we want to study how we live our lives in this polluted world, which is why I had navigating cumulative toxicities in the title. So when we started reading up on this, we were increasingly shocked and became quite depressed because of the incredible intensification of chemical exposures and how little is known. So the Lancet Commission on Pollution and Health, I think it was called, mentioned that half of the chemicals we interact with in our everyday lives are have unknown safety profiles. It's really quite shocking if you think about it. And there's many regulations, but they tend to be class chemical class by chemical class or even individual chemicals like mercury or very ambitious aims like the European Union, zero pollution. I mean, who can come up with a zero pollution aim? So our key issue actually for the research is how do we sustain life on a polluted planet and permanently polluted 
planet we increasingly realize. And we're interested in cumulative toxicities, that is the, tox the chemical exposure to water, air, soil, food, building materials, consumer products, and how all of this adds up in our everyday lives. Um, we want to move beyond studies, even social science studies that go kind of chemical by chemical or exposure by exposure situated and try to grapple with this complexity of so much uh, chemical entanglements. Uh, it's, it's collaborative, our inquiry. So I bring anthropology of the body um, and uh, one of the postdocs, Tate, and Mandela brings political ecology, but we're also linking to environmental health and experimental governance, inspired by experimental governance. So the pro we call the project Embodied Ecologies, because in Embodied, we study how people sense and experience exposures, but in bold, especially how people act to reduce harm. And we, We've done a lot of research in the chemical use project following chemical practices, what people do to balance the goods and the bads of chemicals. And in that acting, we think we can learn a lot about the logics underlying the acting and also the techniques of managing. So underlying this notion of acting or practices is also an idea that what chemicals do is not kind of um, embedded in the chemical, it's always relational. So you can do things with chemicals and chemicals are not stable objects. Um, it's ecological in that we are looking at all of these multiple routes of exposure, but not only that, we're also looking at the political ecology and the social structures that shape the exposures. And we have a strong determination to combine this anthropology with political ecology in this project. Um, the methods are multimodal. We borrowed some, we bring methods from the chemical use project where we experimented with many different methods. But now also we want to go a step further and collaboratively design new harm reduction strategies. And it's actually on this kind of collaborative design that I hope to get some inspiration from you because as a center, you've been thinking about how to do that, how to work in a transdisciplinary way. And um, we, we see lots of, possibilities, but also lots of challenges. So as part of this kind of wanting to collaborate, we decided to work in cities. It says four here, but there's five Grenoble was added, uh, where the local governments are committed to improving the quality of the living environment. So we see local government local governments as collaborators and already very early on going around in, in Grenoble, Grenoble is not here, but we added Grenoble because the vice mayor wants to work with us and the mayor of Baguio wants to work with us and the Under Secretary of Health, uh, no, of Environment in the Philippines is committed to working with us. So there's a lot of high level uh, collaborative intent, not so sure how to kind of canalize that yet. And um, anyway, these cities are all very diverse. And these are the kind of four aims of the, uh, part is behind that but the first the, the first step is that we're doing urban ethnographies we're using methods we developed in chemical use which is grand tours just trying to get an overview of these entanglements of chemicals in situated ecological settings so a multiplicity of embodied ecologies that's what we're studying in the five cities and even beyond. And then we, we get at the political ecology by working with cartography at different levels, different scales. We'll talk about that later. Uh, and then uh, the third aim is to co-create harm reduction strategies, but also what's behind these pictures is to develop new frameworks for studying embodied ecologies. So the methods are, are the methods that we are uh, uh, we've developed the methods actually together with our with the researchers that we uh, are our assisted researchers there's 30 of them in, in each of the countries we played around with the methods tried them out and now we have a, a like a ethnographic instrument where we're exploring how people sense their environments which is exploring the goods and the bads of the environments because we don't want to do damage damage centered research and also cartographically represent how people feel about their environment so it's sensing the environment sensorial cartography 
We're doing digital ethnography of what's going on online. I'll give some examples of that. And then what we want to be doing is co-constructing with different groups of, of our collaborators, do-it-yourself measuring. Um, that's the bit that I'm most worried about. So this is the framework for our collaboration. And what you see in each city, we have three sets of um, people that were work collaborators. These are people living in exposed communities, uh, workers in high risk occupation, and a group that we call toxicity menders. And these toxicity menders are people who, in their profession or as activists, are trying to clean up. Uh, and we don't distinguish between these groups in, in terms of who has expertise and who doesn't. Everybody has expertise. We're studying the acts to reduce harm of all of these actors. And we're also connecting this between all of the city sites. So here is where we link to your, the framework of the <laughs> center here, uh, Healthy Public's work of Stephen Hin Hincliffe, which is, it's not that we are, it's not the problem as we see it is not one of alignment of the public with the experts, but rather the articulating or joining together. This and We're after that, but saying that is easier than doing it. So this is what I would really like to discuss later on. So the focus of our um, of the presentation now is on harm reduction. What are all of these different yeah, people that we're engaging with doing in terms of harm reduction? And what can we learn from looking at these harm reduction practices? Uh, what kind of logic seems to be underlying this? And here, as I said, it's not that we're looking at the, the harm reduction of affected communities in contrast to policies, but we see all actors doing things to reduce harm and we're interested to contrast all the different logics of these actors. So this starts with the scientists. We've been looking into science on chemical exposure and one thing that became really clear here is that among the epidemiologists and the exposome researchers there's a tendency to look at all exposures so that's what we want to be doing cumulative looking at all the exposures but the direction the arrows are in one direction they all enter the body the body doesn't do anything back so uh, that's where uh, the logic here is a logic of making visible actually documenting the harm increasingly also of course the harm on the environment but it's documenting the harm and not documenting how those who are harmed are acting back so it's uh, making visible in a one unidirectional. Then if we look at harm reduction policy, a lot of circular thinking, very strong circular policy. Um, we did a small research on plastics. This is where I was working with Trini Best. And uh, we ended up concluding, let's have to show this one first, that circularity is not working. There's leakiness everywhere. Um, and actually the leakiness is, is, is massive. So the whole concept of circularity, the logic of circularity is very attractive. It also is very attractive in, for people who are producing chemical pollution. It gives the kind of myth that it can be cleaned up. But when we took plastics as a case study, we see that this is very, very hard. It's, there's leakiness everywhere. Another harm reduction concept in policy is the precautionary principle, which sounds really nice. And Europe has adopted the precautionary principle, which means in practice that companies have to present their safety profiles. And there's just not enough people to check these safety profiles. So there's thousands and thousands for, for the plastic chemicals. We, uh, it's in here, there's two and a half, 2,000 substances of concern. And it's really hard for the regulators to do the monocular bureaucracy of checking all of these things. So precautionary principle, it's a nice harm reduction um, principle. Uh, the logic is that it can be done, but it can't be done. So you can't really, and, and again, uh, the logic is that you can say if a chemical is bad or is not bad when a lot of the, effects of a chemical have to do with how it's used and what else it interact, interacts with. So our relational perspective also uh, questions this one chemical at a time. Then um, I'll share a few of our kind of preliminary findings by route, although 
we're looking at how it all adds up. So we, I start with air pollution because air pollution to all the people we've talked with in the grand tours in the very few months that we're working is the biggest thing. So air pollution keeps on coming back as something people want to reduce, uh, act to reduce. This is a finding from our online ethnography where we looked at the Getty images for air pollution. And you see that there's a lot of like source, the, the, the smoke come from somewhere and there's a lot of masks, which might be to do with COVID. And there's a lot of foggy skyline. So these are the images that are circulating online. Okay, what happened? There. Um, this is uh, a finding from our mapping, sensorial mapping, showing how air pollution along the busy roads in the Philippines is seen to be a problem, red. These are, red is where people don't feel good, green is where they feel good. And especially the commuting hub came out as a big problem in terms of air pollution because the little buses wait there to pick up customers and they keep their engine running and people smoke <laughs> while waiting for the buses and it's like a closed space. So air pollution there is, is massive. Um, this is someone on her way to work. Uh, this is cycling along the Marikina River, which is supposed to be where people go for clean air, but even then they're still wearing the masks because it's not that clean. Uh, so these are spaces where there's a little bit well, freedom from air pollution, but still not enough. Um, and online, of course, we often see all of these gadgets that you can measure air pollution, and you can see the websites which show the, the, the figures, the data, digital data. And this is what the advice generally is from Bagi and Marikina, which is run an air purifier. I mean, who can afford an air purifier as an act of reducing harm? And then in Paris and Amsterdam, open your window and let clean air in. Amsterdam is not so clean either, but a lot cleaner. So the other route that we're looking into is harm reduction is the soil. And here, um, just want to show you one of the other ways of reducing harm, which is through a film that Mariana Rios, one of the postdocs on my project did, where she worked very closely with people who are who are trying to clean up land in Saint-Denis, Paris. And they are doing so by, first of all, doing flower farming because they don't dare to grow vegetables there yet. And she made a film, which is a way of a kind of the, the, it's a technique of making visible the soil uh, and also showing that you can't really eat vegetables from that soil. Here, we, one of our researchers is doing field work in one of the islands in Amsterdam, and there's a park there that used to be a dump site for chemicals. There's a Dutch language board there. A lot of, maybe half of the pollution population there is not Dutch speaking, but anyway, there's a Dutch language board there. And one of the things it says is don't let your dog put holes in the soil because it's polluted underneath. And you're also not supposed to eat fish there. Uh, you're not, there's lots, you can't take bikes because you might, the dirty ground might come up. So there's a logic here that you can contain the dirty soil. Uh, the, the, the Amsterdam um, municipality or this, this area thinks that you can tame the soil by telling people not to do things in the park. I mean, this is a park where people go and play with their children. So another way of, thinking about harm reduction. Uh, then with water, here again are some of the images that we got from online. And you see that like with the air, the online images uh, are to do with pipes. So air, there's dirt going into the, these are the most common images. And with water, many image, uh, images of sewage going into the water, people collecting samples and plastic. These are really the big topics also in the, discussions we have with our informants in the grand tour. With the pipes, what's interesting is the concern is hygiene more than chemical pollution. Also, the municipalities that we've been talking to, they're more concerned about the E. coli than about the chemi chemicals, especially in the Philippines. So they're cleaning up the E. coli, but not looking to the chemical pollutants. Plastic is a really big issue. 
And uh, when we talked to our informants of the Grand Tours in Paris and Amsterdam, an issue in Amsterdam that was big in terms of water is whether you could swim in the water or not. So they've been cleaning up the canals. And for people, they feel good when they can go swimming, especially in hot summers. People were talking about a right to be able to swim in the water. So in the Netherlands, you can swim in the canals, they say. Uh, I'm not so sure because just a little bit down the road here is don't um, swim because there's lead in the sludge. Some contradictions there. And uh, in the, the Netherlands is cool in making big infrastructures for cleaning up water. We have a history of water. And what, this one is the ocean cleanup. I don't know if you've heard about it. It's cleaning the, the plastic from the ocean. So the logic of harm reduction here is the circular idea that you pick it up once it's been wasted and not that you stop uh, plastic at the source. This is an image from the Philippines where um, a lot of people are putting water filters into their water systems in their homes because they don't trust the water at all. So online also we see big sales for water filters in the Philippines. It's a key technology for harm reduction. And it, thinking it through with the team, we were realizing that people don't trust the water from the pipes, so they all have to individually have their water filter systems. Uh, PFAS is emerging as a chemical of concern, especially in Europe. In the Philippines, we hardly heard anybody talk about this. Um, this is an important chemical for us because it's a persistent chemical, so it keeps on adding up. And you can see it's in the new rate code that I bought, bought a few days ago. So many um, different products we use. And it has multiple, multiple bad effects. In the Netherlands, we found out that all our water, nearly all our water that, that's uh, around is contaminated above the threshold. So we have like a massive pollution problem with PFAS in the country. Um, and we looked into PFAS online and saw that there's a lot of conversation of PFAS in TikTok. And TikTok emerged as a place where we can really study harm reduction because people are showing what to do, very short videos, and they're showing what kind of cookware to buy or what kind of beauty products to buy which don't have PFAS contamination. And this is uh, the size of the circles is how often a, a specific topic is tagged. Um, and we noticed also with actually online, there's often people who set themselves up as doctors to tell you about what's good and not good about uh, pollutants. So this is... And then um, I'm nearly at the end in terms of harm reduction. We also did a, a special study on plastic, uh, looking into um, how plastic waste is managed or seen to be harmful or not. And what was very interesting there is that the plastic is not seen to be harmful as full of chemicals, additives, it's by people mostly seem to be a, like a stable material uh, and people reuse it a lot. This is from the Philippines um, or burn it for aesthetic re reasons. Well, if you burn plastic, it's really bad. You can get diox dioxins, but that the kind of harm reduction there is to clean up, to reuse and clean up uh, in a situation in, in which in the Philippines waste management is really, really bad. Uh, and so people really feel a sense of control and thinking it through more with the team in the Philippines, we realized that actually what they're doing is the same thing that they used to do with leaves. So it's a metabolic logic where you pick up the waste, you burn it or you reuse it. It goes back into the soil. It seemed to fertilize the soil. So there's a circularity there, actually a metabolic circularity to the harm reduction practice, which is chemically a really problematic because the plastics have lots of really rather dangerous chemicals in them. So enabling, oh, let's see, this is, this is the one I want. So then my question actually for the discussion later is, given that we are seeing all these harm reduction efforts of policymakers in the EU and in the cities where we are working, of scientists who are mainly documenting the harm of chemicals into bodies, of people who are doing many different things, wearing masks, putting filters in their houses to reduce harm of the chemicals. How could we work with all of these different publics to develop, which is our aim, harm, re harm reduction strategies and tools? 
how do you really do that? Uh, we've been thinking through um, working with people to measure, but we're very concerned that if we do that, we're contributing to a kind of damage uh, focused way of doing research where we're pointing to the problem without solving it. So as an example, one of the air pollution issues that one of our researchers confronts is the glues that are used to make shoes in Marikina. Uh, and the harm reduction practice is to not do the gluing in your house where the small children are, but to do it in the street. So when you go into the street, you, everybody smells glue, it's very strong glue. Now we could go in and measure that glue, pretty toxic. But what are we doing? It's their livelihoods. So um, we feel that maybe when we do it, when we start measuring together collaboratively, we should only do that when we think there is some action that we could take to make it better. So with the glue, you could maybe get better glues. So we thought that might be an ethic that we could use when we go into these transdisciplinary collaborations in order to reduce harm. And the other ethic that we're thinking of is that we can only act together with people who are confronted with problems like the air pollution, the commuter hubs, when we have somewhere where we can go with the message that this is a problem. So there should be a, a, a way of improving that kind of filters where we engage or not. We can't engage in all the mess anyway. So that was one of the ideas, but we're very happy to discuss later how we could mobilize and sustain transdisciplinary groupings. Thank you. Super, thank you very much. I think we're going to take five minutes just to give the caption a break. Um, so we're going to turn off the sound now and we'll be back at uh, 3.52, 3, 3.32.
Do um, I have to unmute? No, I assume we lead it. It's got a no. mic in here. I think there's that a mic in here. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, I would now like to invite Dr. Balianis, a uh, senior lecturer in human geography at the University of Exeter, um, to present on planetary health against planetary scale, rethinking the problem of exposure. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for um, hosting us today. It's super exciting. Uh, and good afternoon to everyone joining us from a distance. So my talk today emerges from ongoing reflections on my interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary work with chemicals across the past decade. Chemicals as commodities, as pollutants, as wastes, and fundamentally really as relations. The thinking in today's talk has been um, taking place in conversation with my collaborator and friend, Emma Garnett, also in geography at Exeter, who's not able to join us today, but is very much present in the ideas, questions, and words I'm articulating this afternoon. So a, fair, a set of fundamental um, questions have really shaped our work and our conversations since we met first um, six years ago in a workshop on pollution in Durham anthropology. So today we're taking the opportunity to address some of our questions directly. So it's kind of a weird confessional, but there are no, there are no answers here, but I hope that you might help us respond to our conundrums collectively. So this presentation is in many ways a critical survey of an emerging field. So staying close to the literature and kind of giving an academic context to all the wonderful things that Anita is doing. This is a field led by and large by women non-binary, trans, queer, indigenous, black and brown scholars. And these are scholars doing really inventive, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, anti-colonial and queer feminist work. And because of this, I think it's also a field that is often overlooked. So I'm going to kind of tentatively call this field chemical studies, although those contributing to this field would probably feel indifferent or ambivalent at best about this effort to demarcate the scholarship. Um, I want to note that it's uh, honestly a thrill to present alongside Anita, her collaborative work on chemical use and now embodied ecologies has really been central to shifts in how we understand and intervene in life with chemicals, but more on this later. So my little talk has three sections and I'm going to start with um, uh, an outline of a new political context emerging around pollution and waste interventions. And then I'm going to shift and discuss how the social sciences and humanities can contribute um, to these developments. And finally, I'm going to consider the capacity of planetary health as a kind of framework for doing this transdisciplinary work. So some of the questions that kind of plague Emma and myself at the moment are ontological, epistemological, methodological, and political. So what is exposure? What is the role of the social sciences and humanities in understanding and intervening in toxic exposure? And how can we design transdisciplinary interventions for chemical justice? So as many of you will be well aware, chemical exposure is increasingly becoming prioritized as an intergovernmental matter of concern. With environmental scientists evidencing how chemical pollution is exceeding <laughs> planetary boundaries, exposure is increasingly being framed as a global problem that requires interventions at a corresponding scale. So we're really in a pivotal moment in pollution governance and research. And this is most clearly articulated through the recent emergence of an intergovernmental science policy panel on chemicals and waste. So at the fifth session of the United Nations Environment Assembly in early 2022, member states adopted a resolution deciding that a science policy panel should be established to support action on chemical pollution and waste. So the UN Environment Program is really placing pollution on um, political agendas after decades of centering climate change and biodiversity, which have their own science policy panels. Um, so still without a name and still in formation, the panel can be imagined as a kind of IPCC for chemicals, and it's going to be assembled across the next three years. So they're currently in the process of doing this. In the years preceding this resolution, 
there have been calls from some environmental scientists to take a more interdisciplinary approach to implementing UN chemical conventions. <clears throat> The environmental scientists and policymakers I currently collaborated with have highlighted how the contributions of the social sciences and humanities to understandings of exposure and governance have been totally overlooked. Indeed, researchers from the social sciences and humanities are often entirely absent in international chemical governance meetings, and the social and political dimensions of chemicals remain predominantly represented by civil society organisations in these spaces. So as um, interdisciplinary social scientists working on pollution and exposures, we welcome collaborative public interventions and experiments. However, and there's a big however, we have two concerns at the moment that are important to articulate. So first, we remain um, cognizant of the limits of consensus-driven institutions and critical research on the IPCC has shown us how such <laughs> consensus-seeking institutions depoliticize problems and evade questions of responsibility and justice. So the principles for the panel were recently published and there's actually an invitation to uh, respond to these principles. You should Google the science policy panel if you wanna contribute. The deadline is early June. June 6th, do it, sorry. <laughs> so the principles are being published and the social sciences have of course been rele re relegated to the familiar position of creating behavioral interventions um, and the humanities are pretty much absent. These silos and erasures are of course not unique nor are they recent. Biomedical and environmental sciences dominate chemical policy. They've reduced complexity and unknowns to measure measurable risk but uh, more data, more evidence, as we know, does not necessarily lead to political action. Indeed, these narrow risk managerial logics can constrain action by requiring that debates always take place in narrow scientific framings. So without a radical rethink of what such panels are for, how they're constituted and who they're involved, we're set to repeat many of the mistakes of the IPCC. Our second concern in the emergence of this panel is also epistemological. So the call to approach chemical pollution as a global problem is unfolding at a time when exposure is still dominantly researched as a problem through the individual human body. So in other words, exposure continues to be dominantly understood through a biomedical body-centric model of health. So this enduring habit has been subject to important interventions within ethnographic work um, and feminist and anti-colonial scholarship. Uh, for example, Shadan and Murphy are shifting research with their investigation of chemicals as settler colonial structures. In doing this, they demonstrate how biomedical framings of exposure are based on a colonial separation of land and bodies. Causal explanations that remain tethered to individual bodies as well make little room for considering the ecologies of exposure and health and the, the kinds of relations that um, INEDA is approaching at the moment. So despite growing recognition of the structural determinants of disease and patterns of inequalities, these arguments are still often taking on a rhetorical role in policy and public health. So I'm very excited to see what happens to embodied ecologies. So as Elizabeth Roberts remind us, uh, when the cause gets traced back to individual constitution, it's not possible to examine the production and distribution of, dis of exposures, which means causes remain small, even if they come from the environment and pass across generations. So inspired by efforts to trouble the individualization of exposure, our task is to develop a framework for grappling with exposure as a collective problem. Reading across different disciplines and domains of health, we've been imagining or calling for a critical public, a critical planetary health framework for exposure interventions. Um, so at the same time, our challenge is also to not lose sight of the unevenness of chemical violence, nor of questions of responsibility. As Max Liberon reminds us, we're ultimately not all in this together. 
the challenge to remain situated, but fully attend to the relations of power which produce chemical violence has been central to chemical studies. So before I head you know, into our framework, I'd like to delve a little bit more deeply into the ways exposure and chemicals are being critically reframed. So this is a bit of a kind of a verbal lit review, but someone needs to do this work. <laughs> so chemical studies is really interested in the chemicalization of life foregrounding, interrogating, and often intervening in the environmental, social, and epistemic injustices often re reproduced through chemical entanglements. So heavily informed by relational approaches developed through the feminist and anti-colonial edges of science and technology studies, the field considers how chemicals participate in and shape everyday life. This includes how chemicals assemble publics, disrupt bodies, and enable intimacy and joy. The core work of chemical studies is to question and decenter the risk paradigms which have come to underpin dominant science and the governance of health. Chemical studies also pushes back on naively realist mobilizations of science in some environmental justice scholarship, recognizing that environmental justice is an epistemic justice issue. So chemical studies reframes exposure from sites of violence to sites of knowledge and political action. Again, we've just seen that in Anita's presentation. The relations of power central to chemical studies often have violent effects. However, where this field departs from uh, some environmental justice research is in its refusal to reduce all molecular relations to their violence or to their toxicities. And really, this is a response to some environmental justice research, which has a habit of conflating <laughs> toxicity with violence. Now, toxicity can, of course, serve as a generative concept for critically interrogating injustices. Increasingly, however, we're seeing um, in this literature a refusal to engage with toxicity as a wholly negative concept for three key reasons. So first, toxicity has more than chemical normative associations. Mally Chen highlights how contamination and toxicity are central to the logics of racism and heteronormativity. Secondly, toxicity as violence can produce damage-centered analyses. And these forms of research work to reduce bodies and lands to their toxicity and reify particularly racialized subjects as damaged. Anti-colonial scholars such as Michelle Murphy have been central to moving chemical research away from damage. And thirdly, as a kind of scientific and regulatory concept, toxicity, uh, Max LeBron um, tells us as colonial roots. So when operationalized by the social sciences and humanities in ways that are naively realist, the colonial threshold theories of pollution, which underpin toxic toxicology and assume access to bodies and land are reproduced. So chemical studies instead responds to environmental violence by reconceptualizing toxicity for a more emancipatory ends and futures. Uh, building on the foundation of work on toxic politics by Liberon, Tironi, and Calvillo, Amelia Fisk reconceptualizes toxicity relationally in their ethnographic research as a socio material process, epistemic concept, and embodied experience. The embodied and affective dimensions of chemical toxicity are indeed becoming central to ethnographies of exposure. So Nick Shapiro's experiments with attuning to the chemosphere has been foundational to this approach. The incorporation of such affective achievements to exposure enables more spatial and political understandings of chemical um, entanglements that avoid the reification of science. So this refusal to render chemicals entirely toxic and toxicity entirely negative enables new modes of and spaces for political and epistemological intervention. The ethical task at hand is to learn how to build good relations with bad kin. This is echoing a question that Anita posed from Embodied Ecologies. Um, what does a good life look like on an irrevocably polluted planet? I know um, kind of 
Yes, I've already noted it in my reading. Anyway, this is me speaking internally. Shift to such relational understandings of chemical entanglements now is not a call for a kind of politics of affirmation that we see in new materialism. So in practice, this is a field that is working in more negative or kind of less positive affective relations. So here we're kind of talking about fear, nervousness, panic, weariness, confusion, and sometimes exhaustion. So as a field, chemical studies is not quite negative, not quite hopeful, a radical ambivalence which recognises both the enabling and constraining capacities of chemicals. This rejects the moralising discourses of bad chemicals and the purity politics which Alexis Shotwell demonstrates um, underpins much white environmentalism. So chemical studies starts with the premise that a clean slate is impossible. Um, and Andrea Ford articulates this powerfully in relation to reproductive justice and chemical consumption. She tells us the politics of material purity that underlays projects of cleanup, avoidance or antidote are anachronistic approaches to change. Such purity is no longer available or was never viable to begin with. So what does this work require or entail? Well, first, approaching chemicals not solely through molecular bureaucracies co-produced by industry. So quantifying toxicity through the same logics that enable harm in the first place can work towards superficial solutions at best or reproduce the very chemical violence it hopes to address at worst. Murphy calls for understanding chemicals as infrastructures or regime, regimes of living. This is a form or expansion of biopolitics that extends a beyond biology, which is really a colonial biology, and it extends to include um, kind of, it goes beyond biology and its multi-species entanglement kind of go into a politics of land and plastics. So, so we're seeing, we're seeing um, geology fold coming into the more than human fold. That's a kind of additional discussion I'm not going to go into today. So this reconfiguration of chemicals uh, enables practice beyond critiques of science towards more experimental interventions that work with affected publics and their mobilization for epistemic justice. So chemical studies is a field often defined as much by its methods as it is by its matters of concern. Kim Fortune and her collaborators um, interdisciplinary project, the Asthma Files, which I'm sure a lot of us will be aware of, has laid the foundations for many of the experimental interventions central to this field. So the asthma files brings different data into conversation as an interpretive practice to enable discussions beyond the dominant narratives of scientific uncertainty and the call for more data. It assembles and works across incommensurable logics that are routinely in tension. And experimental, experimental work in chemical studies generates data that offer pathways for action that are not possible with regular, regulatory data in isolation. So experiments with dominant science are also taking place. Uh, and Max LeBron's Clear Lab is um, a key example of um, uh, kind of inverting uh, dominant science for emancipatory anti-colonial um, ends. So these examples of practice are far from perfect and indeed they're characterized by compromise and making do with just good enough da data that can speak with regulatory systems. Um, and there I'm kind of citing Jennifer Cabris and her collaborators. This is what becomes possible when the politics of purity makes way for a messier situated practice. So exposure in this configuration is ultimately situated and relational. It recognizes that the causes of disease cannot be found in a stable object or body. So how or where might these lessons from the humanities and social sciences be put to work at this time? 
Emma and I have recently been discussing how planetary health or a more critical relational version of it has potential to reconnect the separation of bodies and land and attend to the power relations that generate health inequalities. So in this final section, I'll briefly sketch out our still somewhat scrappy thinking um, that we particularly welcome uh, questions on this afterwards. So what is planetary health? This obviously depends on who you ask. Dominant understandings of planetary health are largely emerging from biomedicine and the field is rapidly growing with its own flagship Lancet journal. So the Lancet Commission on Planetary Health defined it as the health of human civilizations and the natural systems on which they depend. And this definition in many ways echoes the Anthropocene. This planetary health discourse also foregrounds the political, economic and social systems that govern the health effects of environmental change. So planetary health at this point appears to be predominantly concerned about the practices of global public health. Although planetary health papers, projects and centres are really proliferating at the moment, what planetary health methodologies and interventions require beyond the routine global health approaches is unclear. Planetary health is often visualised as this container where all other forms of health are fitting or slotting into, but this isn't offering a pathway for research or for interventions. Perhaps this is most irritating as a geographer as it invokes a spatial imaginary of the planet as a container to invoke Doreen Massey or a larger scale in which one health, global health, public health and individual health fit. A second problem with planetary health as it stands, uh, despite raising questions around environmental issues, is that it's largely yet to make its mark within the natural sciences. So the proliferation of planetary health papers within health research is not mirrored in the environmental sciences. Across the past decade, planetary boundaries have instead become a key way for the natural and physical sciences to measure anthropogenic impacts on Earth systems. Planetary boundaries mark tipping points and has become a useful tool for assembling interdisciplinary approaches, crossing problem domains and enabling advocacy. Planetary boundaries, however, are often in tension with the health research Fields such as epigenetics and anti-colonial scholarship have demonstrated that there are no safe exposures or a safe operating space. Troubling threshold theories of pollution implicit in the planetary boundaries model. So you kind of in, in a lot of the anti-colonial um, scholarship, that, that kind of green center of the safe operating space is just impossible. It's a myth. So where, so in some ways then, planetary health and um, planetary boundaries are incommensurable, but this is no way an argument against thinking across them. Planetary boundaries is generated for health and its concern with the deep time of geological processes which take place outside of human generation. So in post-genomic fields, the effects of social and environmental risk factors are contingent on the timing of exposure. Health outcomes can take place many years after exposure in the form of a time lag. These are particularly hard to interpret because it's um, rarely impossible to delineate and evidence a direct link given the multitude of other factors that influence health in day-to-day -day life. So not only then are health interventions difficult to scale up spatially because the context and setting of health, settings of health are heterogeneous, but phenomena like pollutants, viruses are not stable in time, but continually transform. This suggests our responses must be flexible and adaptive. And this is where the social sciences can pay, play a key role in knowledge production, enabling epistemic experiments that can think with incommensurability instead of against it. Uh, to somewhat crudely pivot, uh, we think that there is research that in many ways is kind of doing planetary health or, so, or something close to it without engaging in planetary discourse. And this is research that is largely coalescing around one health. 
So One Health Research has successfully forged links across public, environmental and global health, demonstrating interconnections across species and environments. One Health approaches kind of driven uh, in large part by the veterinary scientists, scientists have provided pivotal interventions in addressing antimicrobial resistance and kind of researchers here at the center and in this university are doing really important work in this space. Although One Health has largely um, sidelined the health implications of geochemical processes, particularly in atmospheres, we see potential for planetary health to be like a critical extension of One Health methodologies. So the potential of One Health is that it is not scalar, but it is about relations and traverses different spaces and places and shifts the analysis from bounded sites to what Steve might call situations. So conscious of time, I'm going to conclude with a set of questions and arguments for thinking exposure through planetary health. First, the planetary is not universal. Heating critiques from anti-colonial scholars about the singular we, nor is it a singular vision. A multiplicity of knowledge is this required to make sense of uncertainties in, and indeterminacy. But what does this mean for questions of responsibility? Who is responsible and the problem is planetary? And finally, how do you do this empirically? If the site of intervention is not the body, what is it? Thank you. Thank you very much for two very, very spirited <coughs> papers. Um, I don't know whether anybody wants to ask any questions. Um, not I'll exercise chair's privilege, but Um, also, if you have a question in the chat, please, please do write in the chat. We've got the chat window open, so. Does anybody have a question? You warm it up. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, <laughs> as, a, as a humanities scholar who is, as you say, not only marginalized, but entirely invisibilized. Um, I was interested before I heard your talks on what you were gonna say about scale, particularly what logic of scale you were going to use. I mean, I, I really like this idea of kind of moving away, using One Health Research critically, engaging with One Health Research as a kind of way of moving away from scale. Um, and, and yes, we've like, I've had conversations with Steve about how scale is, I mean, I don't think he said scale is boring. Um, I said I didn't understand. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, um, but I wonder whether there's something still to be said about what we mean when we use the term scale, if we're going to, for the sake of at least this conversation, um, think about some of your, your papers against the title given toxicity across scales. Right? So what's interesting, and in here I'm really riffing on a cultural studies scholar, Anna McCarthy, um, is the three kind of historically three ways of thinking about scale. Um, uh, scale is, is good. most people think, introduced into the English language by Francis Bacon in the 17th century. Um, and he particularly uses, he takes up scale as a word that comes from Latin for ladder. So in the first iteration of what scale means, you think of a ladder, a kind of hierarchy, and there we kind of devolve from then on into the taxonomy of knowledges that Foucault would uh, ultimately um, sort of look at in um, kind of uh, in archaeology of knowledge. What happens afterwards is that scale is then taken up by um, uh, cartography. So mid 17th century, what scale means is actually 
less a matter of hierarchies, which is where the ladder idea comes from, is one thing on top of another, on top of another. You know, in some ways, um, your beautiful evocative image of planetary health, including One Health, including um, global health, including uh, public health, um, which is a kind of ladder effect, I guess, and more to do with proportionality. So suddenly what we have is this idea that we need to create maps, comes back to some of our questions about colonialism, though I'll kind of put those to the side. And what happens is then um, scale is all about proportions. What are the ratios that allow for things to happen? There's, but, but there's also a reason why Bacon comes up with the term scale in the first place, which is to do with a kind of relationship between empirical knowledge and theory. <coughs> and in some ways, one of the things that's interesting about your papers, one of the ways in which one could pair them is that we've got um, a reflection on a set of very empirical project questions um, in conversation with a theoretical postulation or, um, or, or thinking in those terms. And what that sets up, of course, is this um, rather um, unfair uh, contrast or contra contradiction, contradistinction between the two papers as one being empirical and one being theoretical. And that kind of misses what Bacon's point was, which is to say that actually what scale allows us to do is it allows us to work with differing degrees of abstraction across different kind of knowledge structures. So less a matter of thinking about a hierarchy, one on top of it, another, less a matter of say proportionalities, one is to 250, or you know, if you're a um, rogue, um, discontent, uh, radical cartographer, maybe one is to uh, pick, just to throw ratios out of the window completely. Um, but the what, what, uh, what scale as a kind of matter of competing abstractions does is it allows us to remember perhaps that after all, even if we're talking about a cityscape, and forgive me for being somewhat dated in my interests, but um, we're still talking about imagined communities of some sort of scalar dimension or another. And so then I kind of wonder, I suppose, if I can bring all of this to some sort of point, which heaven forbid any humanities scholar actually did. Um, what, what, are the, what are the ways in which I guess, to bring your questions together. So let me, let me remind everybody the questions, remind everybody and myself the questions that you ended your, your great talks on. Anita's question was, how can people with expertise in these various forms of harm reduction collaborate together without it being damage focused, which is, I think damage focus has been a really interesting kind of um, bugbear for both conversations. And how do we mobilize and sustain transdisciplinary groupings? Um, and, and then um, uh, Angeliki's questions around who is, who is responsibility and how do you take up that responsibility for this type of work? What I wonder is what, um, what role there might be for thinking about scales less as a kind of die-hard um, hierarchy of um, sort of sort of increasing or decreasing kind of um, uh, geographical spatial surroundings and to take up the relational angle in a different way as a kind of set of competing abstractions that we are constantly in negotiation with. Now, 
I don't know if I actually asked you a question there or just gave you a long spiel about scale, but I'm hoping what it's done is warmed up the audience yeah. <laughs> to, to ask something that is a little more meaningful. Do either of you want to take any of the points? Just up? a quick response, maybe, and that is that I guess in um, as an anthropologist working collaboratively, uh, what we're what we are kind of finding out is something that we also did in the chemical youth project is theorizing with and from below. So we're coming to theorizations of what's going on here together and, and um, thinking about what you said about scale. Um, this is where we realized in the former project that the way people engage with chemicals actively reflects precarities. And that, um, and that we can, so we can understand the, the practices as reflecting precarity, which is a key point. And then, but uh, they are all the time active making chemicals work. So this is a theorization based on working together. So it's never only empirical, it's always empirical and theoretical, but it's the way you theorize. And thinking scales, then together, we came up with the ideas that, okay, so if there is this harm reduction from below, as in making things, balancing harms and benefits, then those harm reductions need to be enabled from above. So there is a scale there, which is the above. And the above is how can you create structures that, that enable? This is I ended also with a, the question of enabling healthy environments. So in the new project, we're really interested in how we can mobilize to enable more healthy environments but we're still finding out how to do that. And the, the enabling is about scale because we're interested in the structures. I don't have anything to add. That was great. <laughs> I feel a bit embarrassed about asking this question, which is a bit mundane after that, but it, it was just a very, <laughs> in response to where Angeliki ended with if the site of, um, intervention isn't the body of, of what is it um is there a reason why it's not relations social relations and, and i hesitate to say this at whatever scale that might be <laughs> whether that's about kind of very local because it, it's <clears throat> part of what you were suggesting is the is the problematic if one moves away from the politics of purity in relation to chemicals that the problems to, to be crude are not the chemicals, the problems are the relations in which chemicals are exchanged or distributed or aggregated or assembled or whatever. So to take the lovely example of the glue and the shoe, um, you, you can move it into the street, but that still doesn't do it. Or you can kind of think about, oh, could, could people wear a mask when they were wearing it? And that's still about the body. But if you think instead about the, the relations in which shoes are produced yes, exactly. um, and the kind of power that the shoemaker has, in relation then the relation becomes the thing that yeah and the way it. that the gluing is outsourced to the home is yeah the the, the, yeah. the relations of production yeah. and mm -hmm. i sound like some reconstructed marxist maybe but the, the you are the, <laughs> <laughs> at least there are people in mind <laughs> but the the relations of production are then the site of intervention aren't they and, and it might not always be that at another scale it might be as angeliki's example of the, the i've forgotten what the body's called already sorry that's bringing together the, the, the regulation. And you could think about the relation is, I think we spoke once about having you know, an alternative sage or something that did bring together these different mm -hmm. relations mm -hmm. that would do that. So I, uh, yeah, it, it, what, why is it too simplistic to say that the, relation, the re relations are the, the object of intervention? No, you, that, 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 is, that was going to be my answer. I mean, okay. that it's, and you've listed some examples that come to mind, in, in, at least in my conversations with Emma, we've thought about kind of infrastructures and commodity chains um, uh, as kind of examples and kind of knowledge infrastructures like the one, this chemical IPCC, and then institutions as well, um, and kind of making and making. So in a way, kind of going back to Anita's question of how do we mobilize and sustain transdisciplinary groupings? I think I think we're almost almost going going back to infrastructure one hundred one hundred one 
um, who was it? Stars uh, ethnography of infrastructure was it? It's kind of we're kind of building on top of pre-existing infrastructures, but also tinkering, tinkering with them. That might enable us to to act to take a very materialist version of scale to act at scale. Um, yeah, it's. You're right, Judy. I've just held a mirror back at back at you. It is it is relations at its most kind of uh, elementary, kind of elementally. <laughs> it's relations, but the kinds of relations I've been thinking about with them are have been um, infrastructures and institutions, rather than social relations. Or that's part of it too, because they're part. Oh, I see kind of infrastructures as very social. And economies and all that. Yeah. Uh, yeah well, thank you for both the talks. They're great, and um, it's really nice. It's really nice to hear people at the start of something because it's sort of laying it all out, and I'm kind of uh, um, so. But it does mean there's so many things to think about, and it's not easy. But I, I, I want to start with the sensing, sensing. Um, and I suppose the, the background to my question is sometimes it's hard to know what we are romantically attached to <laughs> and kind of romancing. And then there are other things that we use to muddle through pragmatically. And I, I was thinking of the, the, um, those kind of boundaries in some ways. I mean, you know, as a pragmatic muddling through, I can see why they get used, even though we don't believe them in some ways. But, but I'm just going back to sensing and I kind of think, and I was thinking, when um, it's a long time since I read it, but it was uh, Abram's book, was it? The Spell of the Sensuous and that history of sensing and what we've lost as sensors um, and how we tend not to sense lots. Um, but also, the, I, from memory, the kind of point of that book was the decentering of sense into environments and you get a kind of more than human sensing and so on. So I just wondered if these ethnographies and the kinds of ways of getting at how and in what media people are representing sensing <laughs> all the kind of stuff you're trying to do so i guess this, this is about anthropological method now in some ways what will that sensing tell us in in that you know what what does it offer as a way of thinking beyond our current insensibility to our environments which we we've, we've become expert at not sensing right. our environments haven't we in some ways, I, um, one of the yeah. yeah. No, no, I'm, I'm, it's not got any yeah, more form so, than that. Yeah, yeah. So we, so um, we're actually also concerned about the, the kind of not sensing, but the one of the ways in which we are working with sensing is the sensorial mapping, where one of the exercises because seeing is such a strong sense. Uh, one of the exercises is to guide each other through places not seeing, so one is blinded, and then mapping the, the sensorial experience of not seeing. We contrast the seeing map and the not seeing map. And it's, I, this is what the, the critical sensorial radical counter cartographer does in my team. And Philip Rekasovic, he, he has a, a kind of NGO actually that specializes in this. And um, working with the 30 young researchers with whom we're working now, somehow this really appealed to them. And they came up with representations of environment, which was so different from the, the, the proportional map thing. So that somehow it worked in terms of getting other senses like heat, for example, or sound. So when we contrasted the it's very early field work. We've only done four weeks. Mm. We've been going for four months. So it's all still rather kind of empirical. But what we noticed from the maps in the Philippines is there's much more danger sound kind of in the mapping than the maps that we did in Amsterdam, which were um, more quiet in the way they expressed things. So, so heat, sound, uh, fear, 
came into the maps of people being blinded walking around. Not a very dangerous neighborhood, actually, in the Philippines, but still. So that says something about how people are, their embodied ecology. So the, yeah. you know, fear is also embodied, sound is embodied. So it also opens up our understanding of exposure to include um, other kind of chemical entanglements to do with, with uh, anxious responses which are in the body. So. Yeah, this is how we do. I mean, that's brilliant. I, I, that sensorium, yeah. constructing a sensorium yeah. is so important, I guess. And for smell, a, smell actually. Yeah. Smell came, smell turned out to be a big thing yeah. because especially if you're living in a really polluted place, it smells bad. So, so the good, so the kind of moving away from emphasizing the bad smell, people are are obsessed with good smells, smell this, smell that. They have little smell things everywhere and the, the, the smell they use for laundry and everything, smell is so important. Cleaning smells. So, so smell is another sense. I suppose that, that was my worry. That, I mean, I, I think that's right. The whole sensorium thing, yeah. I say, is really um, help, it's constitutive or generative of a kind of public. But I also then thought about who are the people who are assembling these publics at the moment and the ones that are doing it are people who are selling and what are you not seeing? smelly projects yeah. <laughs> they're selling purifiers they're selling filters and there's an economy of or a security economy here which is really in this space already about yeah. affective the affective economy of pollution is so absolutely yes and then if you go into the so if you in our relational approach, we go into the smells, the fragrances. So there's a whole industry around fragrances yeah. and they're keeping the fragrances secret in mm -hmm. principle because I think from historically, it seemed to be a trademark. So we don't know what these smells are. So it also relates to the not knowing of the chemicals. So yeah, so this is yeah. what we do. We start from the senses, but then we, we follow the smell, <laughs> as it were. I am to Sorry. Add Sorry. Add yes. Another dimension to this as well, smell is really important to scientists who study pollution and they it's often the kind of first data point they have, but it's never in their papers. And so it helps them, particularly with environmental chemists, they'll, they'll look at a pollution in the soil and they'll go, oh, it's that colour, this might be going on. And they'll kind of smell and they go, okay, this starts to narrow down the range of possible pollutions or the particular contamination story making uh, taking place. And also Spackman has, has kind of, there are some STS researchers who, who have shown us the kind of more bodied, taken for granted methods used in chemistry and toxicology. So yeah, so the really senses are in the science yeah. too, but they're just not written up as methods. I guess just to finish up, I didn't want to romanticize that the sensuous human, because a lot of that is done through sensing with and through others, rather like we're, we're often sick because the others are sick, as Anna Singh puts it, but actually we're, you know, our guts and our microbiome and the way those have changed over the years means that we sense quite differently, I think, so, and the way our skin or our mouth microbiome. So there's quite a lot of interest there in the kind of more than human. So Absolutely, that, and also the animals. So people sense pollution through the animals. Right. So they, 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 there's a lot of narratives in our preliminary stuff on, on the fish and on, on especially fish. <laughs> Fish are like a important, uh, not other than human. I see that there are two questions. Um, I'm first going to read out Angela's question, question, and then I'll ask Helen to to give her question. Um, so I'll just read this out. Uh, Angela Marks um, Felipe from Durham. I read the pr proposition of thinking across and beyond scales in a more anthropological geography sense, where scales are strongly present and often visible, yet always relationally produced. I think that this has to do with the point, Angeliki, about space, sorry, um, about spatial and temporal aspects of health. Might I ask you how you, Angeliki and Emma, conceptualize the scales of one health x planetary health and how would you or do you collaborate with doctors and global health researchers working in these emerging fields? Thanks. That's such a good uh, couple of questions. I'll start with a final one. 
Um, we haven't done this yet. So this we're very much at the beginning. We're very much at the beginning of things. So um, if you're doing this, I'd love to chat. The, the first um, more um, uh, conceptual question about scale, I'm going to be honest, Emma and I have put scale in a box and said, we're not going to use it for a bit and we'll see what happens. We both... <laughs> We do. <laughs> Is it useful or not? It's, I, I, I mean, it's kind of, I know it's it's a kind of, it's a cultural object out there. We make decisions around it. It's kind of, we can't ignore it, but I don't find it useful as an analytical concept. So I just don't really use it apart from when I have to, because there's a, there's a kind of a structure there and there's a discourse of scale. So, yeah. I feel a very exposed. <laughs> you weren't convinced to use it after our comments. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah. So it's just the seminar title <laughs> <it's all weird. laughs> Ponder on scale, and then you kind of yeah, but it's boring. Yeah. <laughs> Not that it, it's just yes. I think I think the I've been thinking a lot about one the capacities of one health to be kind of critically stretched. And I think that what One Health has enabled is this is not my field, so I'm kind of looking at it from the outside and listening to colleagues and peers here at Exeter. And it's kind of its power is in kind of cutting a cross scale. And so, you know, maybe in a year's time I'll have a different answer to this question, but for now I've had to put it aside to make, make sense of things and then return to it. For the audience, she's looking at me. <laughs> um, I, Helen, do you want to ask your question? Yes, thank you. I'm sorry, for some reason, I can't type into the chat box. So I just thought I'd put my hand up. I hope that's OK. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. It's a really thought provoking um, um, pair of papers. and. Um, I'm not sure how coherent this is because I'm still trying to kind of um, work through my thoughts, but um, I was really interested in the, um, well, I had one very concrete question for, for Anita, but then I was more generally very interested in the Angelica's comment that one health is not scalar, but relational. Um, I, I'm an anthropologist who, as Steve knows, works on, antibiotic resistance within a One Health framework in highly interdisciplinarity teams um, with people, including chemists and environmental scientists and, and genomics uh, microbiologists and so forth. And I was, I was prompted by the very uh, helpful comment by the chair about um, the idea that this scale being to something to do with the relationship between empirical knowledge and theory, because something that has struck me very recently as we've been trying to put together a, another One Health project for a large call, and I work in India and China, um, including on environmental issues uh, through wastewater epidemiology, is that we're, we're trying to track essentially chemical movement through the environment across One Health spaces. But to do that effectively, empirically, um, I'm guided by my colleagues from other disciplines to understand that we have to do that in a geographically very small space because the complexity of the interactions are such that you ideally need at the most one river basin or a little bit of one city in order to be able to actually gather the data that you need. Um, and so, I mean, in a very crude way, and sorry if there's geographical spatial understanding, you know, the, my answer would be not to, you know, if it's not the body, what is it? Well, it's a place is what it is. Um, because, you know, people who are looking at the microbial and at micro scales and at, tiny residues of chemical substance in water, we're thinking in a planetary way almost, but the only way to actually get a handle on that is to do it in a geographically very clear, specific location. 
So I, wouldn't, I guess it's just a comment, but I, I was kind of interested in uh, that relationship between the empirical and the, you know, methodologically versus conceptually how you'd understand these relations. But wouldn't you then still want to follow what you find there in the geographic space outwards? I'm thinking microplastics. Microplastics attract microbes and they come from all over. So wouldn't you still want to understand their complexity in this place with other processes that kind of move in and out of that place? You absolutely would. And I, I mean, I guess, you know, to, to, I mean, in, in the work I do in India with, which is actually looking at um, and development of antibiotic resistance within the context of pharmaceutical industry waste. Uh, yeah, pharmaceutical. I mean, we're also trying to look at the, you know, the global value chain yeah. and, you know, exporting and import, you know, these yeah. kind of huge scale. But from a, from a, as I say, it's a, it's a methodological issue. If you're trying, you, you can say they attract things as if that's an unproblematic scientific statement when it comes to the development of antibiotic resistance. And I think it's the same for chemical exposures of all kinds. I mean, the nature of the evidence, it does not necessarily, you know, an association isn't necessarily a cause. We can't say for sure because we are seeing antimicrobial resistance genes in a particular environment that they are causing resistant infections in the humans. To make that association, you have to do an awful lot more work to try to see, um, ideally comparatively, in two very small sites in very different places or more, um, what the relationships between these are, because you know those chemical interactions between different kinds of chemicals are happening all the time. Are the heavy metals in the water, does that affect how the microbes evolve. Do you see what I mean? So yes, it's all interconnected. I'm not saying you can, it's all interconnected, but you can't actually infer on a global scale very effectively. You have to actually look at it on the ground in a place. Does that make sense? No. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. and that points to the kind of, uh, uh, it points to the center of the discussions around this new kind of chemical IPCC is kind of, how on earth do we make sense, make sense of all this? Um, it's a, it's a, a massive methodological issue. How, how do you think across these studies when there is no kind of coherent, it's very, yeah, it's, it's a very kind of different object to climate change. Just because I've been working with Helen a bit on these, on, on some of the projects that Helen's involved in. Uh, and one of the real drivers of that is the, as I understand it, Helen, is the, sam is the, the kind of logic of sampling. And you need a large enough population on which to get a sample and then kind of compare that to say, what's the kind of carriage rate in that population? And that then makes us think, well, what, how can we put a boundary around that population in some way? So that's why you get into this kind of language of what's the community gut? When you're talking about wastewater, for example, it's like who's coming into that? You you go around the world looking for these sites that are reasonably like this. The the big poo outlet from this place was a community gut, wasn't it? It was great. It was one one pipe leaving this campus. So during the pandemic, that was a great place to find what the community <laughs> gut was of XT University. Yeah. It was just a wonderful <laughs> experimental site. <laughs> But it's not scale, as far as I understand it. That's that's about a lot. Uh, I still don't understand scale, so I'm not even going to go there. But, and you've made it worse again. But I, I, I think it was that logic of somehow it's kind of politics and knowledge for me rather than, I don't know, maybe it's scale. In the interests of um, leaving things having made it worse, I'm now going to use this as an opportunity to kind of bring our discussion to an end, which um, is probably the best thing to do when one's talking about works in progress, um, casting ahead to the successful project to come. Um, but for now, thank you very much. Can everybody thank the speakers, please?